I want to read to you from Colossians 3, 12 this morning. Is any, I thought I'd have a summer break from Mark. Okay. But we'll be back. Colossians 3, 12. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then... You must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any one of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives is to guide you in the decisions you make. For it is to this peace that God has called you together in the one body. And be thankful. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Everything you do or say then should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks through him to God the Father. I know that many of you were here a fortnight ago at Open to God at 7 o'clock, but actually I want to start from where I was there and uh, just recount a little bit of it because since then I've gone on thinking about it don't often think about my own sermons but I went on thinking about it and uh, I've been challenged by it in different ways and so I want to start from there and build on I hope you don't mind a fraction of repetition and of those you those of you who weren't here a fortnight ago you can learn a bit about my holiday so it's a bit of a bonus isn't it I took this jacket with me on holiday actually but didn't wear it so I thought I'd wear it this morning because it was too hot. It's almost too hot now, actually. But it was very wet earlier on, and I thought my anorak, I thought, not quite. So. But I was in Italy for my holidays, in Naples, which was exciting. And uh, the Bay of Naples is dominated by Vesuvius. And I uh, thought, well, we ought to go and look at this. So I got on an Italian suburban train, which is exciting, and then an Italian bus, which is good for your prayer life. And... Uh, <laughs> This drove up Mount Vesuvius, and all these hairpin bends and what have you, and then, and then we get to, near to the top, and we 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 climbed up the last sort of 500 feet of this track, and it gets to be it's all dirt and it's all sort of lava and it's all ash and it's all black and it's all everything, you know. And you get to the very top of the mountain, and then you walk along the top, and there's this narrow pass, and down there is the sort of uh, the middle of the volcano, the vents, and out there is this great view of the sea. That's what I said. That's, that's it, really. And I thought at the time, just in very bold terms, I thought, this is a bit like the church, and this is a bit like my spiritual life, because it's very big, and it's very solid, and it's, it's firm, and I've got to the top here. But for a volcano, there's absolutely... No flames, no smoke, no cloud, no steam, no smell, no bubbling, no lava, no nothing. And I'm thinking, that's very much like me in my spiritual life. You may feel a bit of that. I'm sure most of you have got more flame than I have. But that sense, and I thought, I'm standing on a firm rock here because it's very hard. This stuff is very, very hard. It's not just weak. It's really crusted, hard rock stuff, you know. I think I've got something firm to stand on. I'm standing on the rock, but I'm not living with the fire, if you like. I thought, is that like the church? We're standing on the rock, but we're not living with the fire. I looked at all the uh, the layers of lava and ash and thought, yeah, we stand on this. We stand on the word of God that has been produced by His fire. This mountain is the results of the fire, but it's not the fire. I'm thinking there, looking at the ash, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the saints that have gone before, all of this, the fire of God in men and women's hearts. 
I'm standing on that and their testimony and what the Spirit has done. But I'm not necessarily living with the fire. And I ought to be. The Bible speaks about the fire of God as the presence of God. The burning bush, the, 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 the fire descending on Sinai and, and, the, and the fire at Pentecost, you know. It speaks about us being filled with the fire. What John says of Jesus. And he will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And in speaking of Jesus as he's sorting out the temple, he said, fire will consume him. He will be consumed like fire for his enthusiasm for the work of the kingdom. I said, well, I've got that fire. I'm standing on the rock that the results of the fire, and I believe in the fire. I tell you what, everybody on Vesuvius is up there because it's a volcano. The fact there's no fire is irrelevant. It is very interesting. I've been on far higher mountains and far more impressive mountains. But no mountain I've ever been on has had lots and lots of Japanese tourists running up like working ants, you know, following a person with an umbrella. It's very tempting if you've got an umbrella, isn't it? But, you know, all that, it just doesn't, you don't see that on a big mountain in, I don't know, the Rockies or something like this. Why? Because it's not a volcano. It's all about fire. Everybody's talking about fire. And it's not there. We, we stand on the, the results of the fire, of the word of God and the work of the Spirit subsequently. And we are people of the fire. We have had Pentecost. We sing spiritual songs. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Our, our whole ethos and essence and being depends on the Lord here in his spirit. And yet very often I lack fire. I'm more like a... I'm more like a wet bonfire. There is fire somewhere down there, but it's just that sort of bit of smoke just coming up. I see. Now, this has worried me and got stayed with me in the last few weeks because uh, in this period after Pentecost, in the old readings, which we tend to study uh, in, our Bible, in our prayer meetings and communion on Thursdays, it's all about mission. And we have these passages where you realize that the men of old are full of the fire. Fire for the gospel and fire for other people. And I'm particularly interested in where it says, uh, zeal for thy house, O Lord, will consume me. And he said that applied to Jesus. He was on fire for the work of his father. He was on fire for mission. And so were they. We had, first of all, the, the, about three weeks ago, the mission to the individual. And we had that great story of um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the effort and enthusiasm that's expended for one person. He goes, he's sent by the Spirit. He's a beat into the Spirit. He's sent down to a desert place. It doesn't look a good mission field. No one goes there anymore. Great mission field. Then, great, he, he finds a eunuch in a chariot. And you're thinking, this is not a good opportunity. But then he runs along by the chariot. And the chariots, and the, the eunuch is reading a difficult bit of Isaiah. Who wants, and he wants an exposition of it when he's running up. He gets in the chariot. He gives the exposition. He speaks the good news of Jesus. They find some water. The eunuch is baptized. That is mission. But I'm thinking of Philip. This man is on fire for God. He wants to speak the good news of Jesus. He doesn't tell him a bit more about the prophet Isaiah. He talks about Jesus. And when the baptism comes, when there's an opportunity for baptism, he baptizes him. Have I got that fire for one man, for one person? Do we have the fire to share the good news of Jesus with one individual in a bad... I, I, if I'd looked at that, I'd have said, and I've, and I've worked in semi-desert, I'd have thought, the last thing you want to do is run. I want to run. It's bad enough being hot. And I'd have thought, man in a chariot, it's not a good opportunity. Let's see if I can find somebody walking. You know. And an Ethiopian eunuch. <sighs> Cultural problems here. And I'd have thought, oh, this is not a good time. Perhaps, perhaps the guy should, I should give him a tract. Perhaps I should invite him to an alpha course. You know, it's, I'm not going to do it now. I just don't have it in me. I'm just... <clears throat> And when he says, here's some water, can I be baptised? And I'm thinking, does he know everything he needs to be known to be baptised? This man has a fire there, burning in his heart. Yes, let's get down in the water. <coughs> Do I have that? Do you have that? I, I'm thinking, you see, I'm thinking. Oh. 
I'm not saying I won't share the good news. If I'd met somebody on top of them on Vesuvius and they said, do you know anything about volcanoes? And I said, well, I've done a fair bit of geology. And they said, OK, tell me about volcanoes. I'd have told them. None of us is not going to say we won't tell somebody about Jesus if they want to know. But that's not the same thing as fire, is it? Fire in the heart. Then the week after, we're challenged by the broader aspect of um, Peter and Cornelius. You know, the great... the. Um, the sheet is let down in, the, in, in his great visionary dream with all the animals in it. And God says, kill and eat. And he says, they're all unclean or most of them unclean. And God says, don't tell me what's unclean. And then Cornelius has sent these Gentile servants and he goes and there's his big Gentile family and all the hangers on. And he begins to preach as he's never done before in their house as he's never been done before. And now he's unclean and then the spirit falls it's a lot. And then, and then, even when he gets the interview with the men in suits back in Jerusalem, because he shouldn't have done it, he goes back and he's still full of fire and says, look, the spirit fell. What can we do? If God is for this, how can we not be doing it? The man is not just sort of apathetic. He doesn't say, oh, well, we've had some inquiries about from some Gentiles. I think we should discuss it. They go and discuss it after he's done it. He's up for it. Do I have that fire? We think as Gentiles, what a great opportunity that was because it broke out of the Jewish community and it broke into the whole world and that's good news because that's us. Otherwise it would have just been stuck with Orthodox Jews. But on the other hand, if you think about it, this great expansion into greater things is quite challenging. It's all very well for Wesley to say the world is my parish. I know some really good evangelical Anglican vicars who do not want to be told the world is their parish. They have got enough to do with their parish. We have a few people and then suddenly we're told everybody is a target for you. Is this good or bad or am I daunted? We come here on a Sunday morning. We're the biggest group of people we've met. There's a few people moping around out there, but that's it. On Maisie Day, and they all turn up, there's thousands of people. You think, gosh, there's an awful lot of people here to be saved, aren't there? I'd rather just have a few. It's very tiring. It's very challenging. You go into a great city uh, at night or on a train, you look at all those lights, and you think, who are all those people? They are the mission field, and I'm overwhelmed. I just don't have it. Peter says, let's go for it. St. Paul says, let's go for it. These people have the fire. The fire of the Spirit. The fire that Jesus had. The people that built these buildings were on fire. Some people say, how on earth did anybody build something like this? All you've got now is the results of the fire. Hmm? Wish it was a slightly more solid, but, you know, this is the solid result of the fire. You see all these chapels all over the place. That was the result of the fire in people's hearts, men and women's hearts who built this stuff because it was full of the spirit and power and worship and what have you. Looking at an obituary of a, uh, uh, the wife of a crusader leader that uh, uh, we, I knew well when I was a teenager and coming to Christ, said that she'd worked for 35 years with juniors in Crusaders. And you think, this is a woman with a, with a heart for the gospel and a heart for lots of young children who were not always in those 35 years terribly well behaved. This is a woman who, out of a busy working life with a husband and a big family, would have somebody like me, some recalcitrant adolescent, home to tea to encourage me about Jesus. I don't have people home to tea to encourage them about Jesus. Where does this get this fire from? And then, if that is not enough, there are signs of fire at the Methodist Conference. This is extraordinary. And Steve Weil preaches and teaches that Methodism is about evangelism, about having a fire for Jesus and for others. And he challenges us. Our president challenges us and says, I challenge the Methodist church that every one church makes one new convert in this coming year. And people have already said to me, that's a bit steep. 
But it is. Because as far as we can see, the whole circuit of 12 churches did not manage to create a new convert in the whole of last year. I'm challenged by that. It's put sort of more flesh on the bit of, about the fire bit. Indeed, what concerns me with the fire is not simply that I don't have it, but I'm not sure that I want it. I'm not sure that I could deal with it. We say, come Lord Jesus, but don't come straight like that. This morning, if I said, would the fire would come, what's going to happen with the 11 o'clock service? My, my daughter's gone camping for the first time with her husband. And she was down here, we were buying a new stove, a new gas stove for her. So it's all methane and propane. And the bloke says, it's all very safe, you know. And that's what I like, fire that's safe. You know, it's just a little flame that's... I'm a paraffin man. <laughs> I remember when I was running this camp um, for boys, I'm a young man now, I'm supposed to be an expert. And uh, I was running through the big primuses and one of them, you know, went a bit of blowback and there was a lot of flame and everyone runs away. My mate who knew my, about as much as I did, which was a lot, said, said Whoa! so he throws a bu- an empty bucket over it. So anyway, the bucket had creosote in and... Uh, <laughs> There's an enormous explosion. The bucket goes right up in the air. It blows the thing off and burns down a bell tent. And everybody says, that shouldn't happen. But that's what Pentecost is about. It's not this little flame. (laughs) And whenever you want to, you can turn it off at half past ten. You know? I'm thinking that. That is what it was like with Peter. That's what it like with St. Paul. In fact, what worries me is that I'm, I'm, a, I'm organised so that I believe in the Spirit, I talk about the Spirit, but I don't want too much flame. Along the rim of Vesuvius, there's a series of tea huts. And they sell postcards with digitally changed pictures of Vesuvius with flame coming out the top. They sell knickknacks of um, the, the sort of lava carved into things and other things the whole thing depends on the fire but i tell you if there was any fire they wouldn't be there you can't run a tea house when it's erupting and i'm like this i want to talk to you about the fire of the spirit in your heart but i don't want you to all run a moat this morning because i would indeed even at the Methodist conference, after, after uh, Steve had, had spoken inspiringly for an hour, they went out for a tea break. You don't have a tea break at Pentecost. They didn't say, Peter says, I'll talk to you later. We're having a tea break. We don't have that. Where do I have this enthusiasm from? I was in Tesco um, uh, petrol station on Friday. Now that's an inspiring place to be. Friday evening in Tesco, pe- Tesco petrol station, and I, I'm, there's a chap in front of me who's got off one of these sort of Gucci scooters with a with a box on the back for pizzas. He's in there with all his lycra kit and that, and he's saying to, she's saying, "What do you do?" He says, "We deliver takeaways." He said, "We're a new company." He said, um, uh, "And what's important about us is that we will do takeaways from any shop to you, not just takeaways." Oh, she says, "That's interesting." He said, "I've got a leaflet in the in the on the thing. I'll, I'll bring you in one now." So as I'm buying my petrol, he zooms back and gives her the leaflet, and she said, "Oh, no, I could find that. I've got I think I've got a birthday party. I could use that." And I'm thinking, so what have I said about Jesus? This, this guy is enthusiastic about pizza. <laughs> and so I could preach sermons like this to you a long time. And we could be inspired. But you know that it doesn't just work like that. Yes, we need to plan. Yes, we need to put ourselves in position. Yes, we need to run things. Yes, we need to run worship that people want to come to. Yes, we want to do this and that. But What about the fire? And so we got to Colossians this week in those readings, to a passage which does not seem to be particularly that way orientated. In Colossians 3 and in Ephesians 5 that echoes it, we have this sense of the people of God having to sort themselves out. Good qualities, love, care, compassion, good relationships within the church, you can see it building, 
becoming more ambitious, doing things together, teaching, admonishing, that's difficult. Then the bit we never read, going on to families, women obeying their husbands, husbands being nice to their wives, children, all that sort of thing, right through um, employers, slaves in those days, more and more ambitious, more and more fired up to be different and different and different and different. And at the end, preaching of the gospel, and you remember in Ephesians 5 saying, and put on the shoes as the readiness to announce the good news. In other words, it's like a ski ramp. They, these two passages build up more and more fire, which explodes from quality to ambition, family, church, community to mission. But what interested me about this is not that that's there. That's fairly predictable. We're saying, how do we get there? It is at the beginning of Colossians. It says, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must. And Ephesians 5, since you are God's children, you must. This is front loaded. This is not if you sort, if you're full of love, if you're full of fellowship, if you do mission, if you make lots of converts, then you are the people of God. But it's because you are the people of God. Because he chose you and you loved you. And you realise that the fire in these people is because they are absolutely alive with what Jesus has done for them. They are on fire for him because they realise he is on fire for them. And I thought, that's it. I've lost and I often lose the sense of how much Jesus is on fire for me. We sung that hymn, how great the Father's love for us, how deep the Father's love. I know that's theology, but am I got it burning in my heart? Peter has it. Paul has it. And he's saying about a Philip, you know, with the Ethiopian eunuch, here is a man who has been saved. I want the Ethiopian to be saved. Here is a man who knows what God can do in his heart. I want this man to know as well. There's a sense of gratitude. If Jesus has done this for me, then should I not do it for him? There's a sense of freshness. This is great in my heart. Why should these other people not miss out? Why should they miss out? The fire is there because the fire of Jesus is there for you. How could I do less? I said once by... Um, um, it says, it says where, where you've got that you are the people of God, so then... He said, whenever you find a therefore in the Bible, you want to make very sure that you know what it's there for. That's a terrible pun, but it's really true. These hinge lines, Derek Prince, wasn't it? These hinge lines, thus God has loved us, thus God has chosen us, thus we are saved, therefore. And we will be fired up this week. If in our hearts we know that Jesus burns with love for us, <coughs> that the fire is there. Notice the, um, I think it's the death of uh, Nicholas Winton, now Sir Nicholas, the guy who organised very quietly the, uh, the, the, the saving of so many of those girls um, from Czechoslovakia, uh, Jewish teenagers and children at the beginning of the war. It was an interview with, uh, you know, a lady who's no longer young. And she said this. As she was coming out on the train, she realised that she'd been saved from death. She said this. On that train, I determined to make my life a life that was worth saving. I thought that was good. I was determined to make my life a life that was worth saving. If we have been saved, will we live a life that is worth saving? If we have been loved with a fire that Jesus has for us in his heart, will we not love in our lives with that same fire? So that, interestingly, as is so often the case, as we come to this simple communion, which seems the least missionary activity you could ever have, that we're not out there, we're not talking to anybody. 
Let's pray this morning a dangerous prayer. Let us pray that the Lord will reignite his fire in our hearts. Perhaps you need to remember your testimony when you first came to know Jesus. Perhaps you need to remember how it is that you are saved. I know I often need to do that. So that I am set on fire by Jesus' love. And I have an effervescence um, to go for the gospel and to go for those around me. I would have thought that one new convert from this entire church over a whole year is rather under-promising if we are fired up by the Lord.